views and opinions expressed in this program are those of the participants and do not necessarily reflect the views of BronxNet or the program underwriters. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Open, the one and only show that opens the Bronx and the rest of the world right to you. I'm your host, Darren Jaime, and today we're going to update you on what's happening in and around our borough, as well as across New York City. Well, coming up on today's show, we go front and center with the president and CEO of Getting Out and Staying Out on how they are empowering young men through goal-oriented programming and comprehensive support services. Also, we'll learn about a program that's designed to help new parent employees, help them to feel empowered and supported when navigating their return after parental leave. And then we're going to sit down with an orthopedic surgeon on the resources he's providing in order to meet the needs of his patients, especially during the coronavirus and post-COVID-19. We'll give you more details a little bit later on in the show. And then also, we'll learn about a curated collective for NYC educators as they gather sharing resources as well as networks geared to fostering stronger educational support in underserved communities. And then finally, we're going to talk to a not-for-profit that's committed to preventing homelessness and how it's adapted its services to the COVID-19 pandemic. So stay tuned because all this and much more is heading your way. Right now, we're officially open. And hello, everyone, and welcome to Open. You are watching the show that opens the Bronx and the rest of the world right to you. I am Darren Jaime, and today is Wednesday, June 17th. And yes, Open is a live and interactive program that brings the Bronx and New York City straight to your TV sets. We encourage you to stay connected to us here at Open and then also on all of our social media platforms at BronxNet TV. Well, a lot has certainly been going on through the past week. We'll take you through a few things with our Bronx updates. Immediately following the death of George Floyd, New York State Governor Andrew Cuomo signed in the legislation the Say Your Name Reform Act. The reform agenda is a landmark policing reform that will reduce inequality in policing and re-image the state's criminal justice system. These reforms include the allowing for transparency of prior disciplinary records of the law enforcement officers by repealing 50A of the civil rights law, banning chokeholds by law enforcement officers, and also the prohibiting of false race-based 911 reports and designating the attorney general as an independent prosecutor for matters relating to civilian deaths. Well, Governor Andrew Cuomo also took to the airwaves saying that he would shut down the city again if residents don't adhere to social distancing guidelines. The governor announced the state has received about 25,000 complaints about health and safety violations since the start of the pandemic, an alarming figure mainly involving bars and restaurants this is after calls came into the governor's office and 200 people were found at least par caught partying in the East Village in Manhattan. Governor Cuomo stated, quote, I'm not going to allow situations to exist that we know have a high likelihood of causing an increase in the virus. Any bars or restaurants violating or reopening rules and guidelines can result in the loss of that establishment's liquor license. Additionally, individuals can also be fined for open containers and social distancing violations. The governor reminding New Yorkers that local governments have the right to enforce and should enforce all reopening guidelines, and any failure to enforce these rules can result in the closure of businesses. Well, in other local news, we want to tell you about a group of community members and residents 
that demand the reopening of the access to Frederick Douglass Community Gardens. Our BronxNet reporter Sanji Lopez brings us the story right now. A group of community members and residents of NYCHA Frederick Douglass houses came together to protest and demand access to their community garden, which has been locked and inaccessible in the public housing complex for over a year. A week before the protest, community activist Sugar Tavares shared this video on social media as a call to action. 20 feet from this space, the residents are relying solely on food donations to supplement food for themselves and their families. Sugar says that the fact that this space is inaccessible exacerbates the high food insecurity rates in the Bronx and that this, paired with the COVID-19 crisis, poses a huge threat to the community. For the past year, she and other community activists and leaders have sent countless emails to local representatives advocating for the garden but have not heard back. Instead, they decided to take matters into their own hands by breaking open the garden chains. Who's garden? There is no reason for a community to have hunger or food insecurities when there is a garden this size. There is no reason in the middle of a global pandemic that has caused so many hardships for people and their families for there to be locks on these doors. We are here because we have advocated for more than a year, absent of the support of NYCHA administration, of local elected officials to help us be able to secure this space for the residents and their use, and not just for their use, but for their control. We're in an era right now where we have to fend for ourselves because nobody's going to do anything for us. So we got to fight for ourselves. So we're going to take this over again. We're going to teach our kids how to grow food. And most of all, our people need to go, they need to make sure that they go out, get their absentee ballots and vote. With the garden back in community control and accessible to the Frederick Douglass residents, Sugar is hopeful that this will help dismantle food insecurity in this community. This is the size of a tennis court. This community, we can grow vertically, we can grow horizontally. This would give this community, when planted right, access to fresh fruits and vegetables year around. And it would, that would be able to be done very affordably, very economically, and very efficiently. Reporting for BronxNet, Sanji Lopez. And thank you, Sanji. That's all the time we have for our Bronx updates. Stay tuned because we do have more open coming up right after this. Getting Out and Staying Out is an organization that's designed to help young men to avoid involvement in the criminal justice system by reshaping their futures, also through educational achievement, meaningful employment, and as well as financial independence. GOSO focuses on promoting, promoting, I should say, personal, professional, intellectual growth, as well as comprehensive support services during the pandemic. 
The big question is, how has the organization adapted to providing its programs through COVID-19 and navigating right now? Here to join us right now is Dr. Jocelyn Rainey, who's the president of GoSo, and uh, we're glad to have you, Dr. Rainey. Thank you so much for having me. I'm especially excited to be um, on BronxNet because so many of our participants are from the Bronx. So I um, really appreciate telling our story here today. And it's an important story. As we talk about, you know, all that is going on right now in terms of we see protests out on the street. We know all these things that are happening. Um, really, it's not just about police brutality, but it's about the whole criminal justice system. And I know that your organization really caters to young men and really making sure that that's not the path that they end up on. Exactly. So GOSO does um, serve young men between the ages of 16 and 24. The majority of the young, men's that we, young men that we serve are young men of color. Um, many of them are from the Bronx um, and Harlem. We do serve across all five boroughs, um, but of course we have a certain um, catchment area, which ends up being the Bronx and, um, and Harlem. Um, GOSO was started in 17 years ago by, uh, by a man named Mark Goldsmith. Mark went to um, Rikers. He met the young men at Rikers and he thought that there for the grace of God is me and um, thought like, how could he help them to, um, how could they help, how could he help them once they were released in order to be able to um, connect to jobs and education. And that was how GOSA was started. And um, 17 years later, in January, I took over as CEO and president of GOSA. Amazing. And so you guys do a great job of providing services to the community. Let's share a little bit about some of those services that you actually provide. Okay, so GOSA works with over a thousand young men. Um, and the work that we do primarily is um, helping them to um, acquire the skills and the support that they need in order to be successful. Um, we have programs on site, um, education programs for them to get their high school equivalency pro di di diploma, also mm -hmm. programs for them to move into the labor market. We have a um, stipend internship program, and we have a job readiness curriculum that every one of our young men go through um, in order to help to prepare them for interviews, workplace um, norms, those kinds of um, skills that you need in order to be successful. We also have a program called SAVE. Um, SAVE is a cure violence program. We are particularly proud of that program because the um, folks that run that program are um, credible messengers. They're from the community that they serve. Um, we work with um, three NYCHA complexes that are in our in our community in East Harlem, and our staff go into those um, into those communities where they often live, and make sure that folks have the resources that they need, and also are there to interrupt or disrupt violence, particularly gun violence. Um, we also provide programming for the community. We have game nights. We are currently giving out PPE. We um, we connect them to work. We also connect them to education opportunities there. Um, so that program is really about making sure that, you know, the young people that live in that community are, are, not, um, are not going through the criminal justice system. Yeah. Well, you know, when you talk about reaching these young men, obviously for a lot of people, that may be a hard task, reaching, reaching the youth of today's society. Um, but you seem to have a considerable measure of success in doing that. Share with us a little bit about the secret sauce, if you will, to how are you able to really connect with these young men and have such positive outcomes? I think the secret sauce is that GOSO literally meets our young men where they are. Um, we meet them there literally and figuratively. We provide services that work with them on their emotional well-being. Um, we also work with a lot of young men who are detained. They've been detained in Rikers, other juvenile facilities. We work with young men that are in prisons upstate as well. And that, you know, our team actually goes to those spaces and works with the young men in order for them to know that when they are released, that they can come to our offices and work with us more towards um, towards reaching their goals once they're released. Um, and oftentimes they tell their friends about GOSO. Um, our doors are always open. I think that you know the majority of our staff being um, licensed social workers 
is really important to the success of Gozo. So what they work a lot on are the trauma and the emotional needs that the young men need in order for them to be successful in all of our other programming. Um, it's, it's an amazing program. We also make sure, which I think is really important as a mother of two young men myself, you know, we make sure that there's food always in our refrigerator and there's a place for them to um, fellowship with each other. Um, so as we're trying to do this really important um, programming that happens, in our site, we also understand that we have to be able to serve the whole person um, in a way that helps them to be um, more successful once they leave GOSO. Well, I know a lot that's talking about, what well, we're talking about being successful. Uh, one of the things about success comes with, by way of uh, after incarceration, mm -hmm. right? I wanna talk about incarceration for a moment because a lot of people do suffer from incarceration, mass incarceration. I know that something's yeah. being dealt with uh, prison reform that's being tackled. We know the governor uh, and legislators are always attacking that. There are racial disparities when it comes to uh, mass incarceration. The communities of color always find themselves on the other side of the law. Um, yeah. Give us a little bit about your work and your beliefs um, when we're talking about these racial disparities because uh, as we're talking about fixing things, um, this is one area that needs a strong fixing. It does. So when you look at, you know, this country, we have 5% of the world's population, but we have 25% of those who are incarcerated. That's huge. And when you look at, you know, the um, that young African-American men are five times more likely um, to be incarcerated than white men, that we have to look at what are the systemic racial issues that are happening in our country that causes that. So you think about the majority of the guys that live, that we call them the guys um, that go through our program, you have to also recognize that they come from communities where there are where there are real socioeconomic issues, where they're going to the schools that are the least resources, they live in the communities that that have the least resources and then you know they're 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 ending up in situations where they are they are having interactions with um, with the police and with the law I think that the, the the issue is that we have to really keep our foot on the pedal around um, bail reform and um, criminal justice reform because when I talk to the young men that I serve what I recognize is that you know many of them end up being detained or incarcerated or mostly detained for long periods of time because they're not able to, you know, acquire bail, right? So right. bail reform is really, really key. Like what, what one of our young men may be um, detained for at Rikers for several months, sometimes years, is something that someone who was able to obtain bail would be let go would be let go for. So these things are really important when we talk about racial disparities. And then the other issue is um, thinking about why we have social workers and why it's so important to deal with the trauma and the emotional issues is that, you know, there is um, incarcerated, in, incarceration induced a mental illness, right? Like being being incarcerated, being, being contained, um, that's really, that does cause mental illness. So all of these things have to be fixed in order for um, for there to be real real change in the criminal justice system there has to be you know there has to be an understanding that people who are um, who don't have the resources don't have the socioeconomic means don't have the networks are, are going to have a different outcome if they're if they're in this situation so those are really key um, things and really you have to look at why is it that you know young men are young men in the age group that we we work with 16 to 24 are more likely to be to have a police interaction um, if they're a young man of color than if they were white like one in one in three are going to have an interaction with the police and what does that mean um, recently we see what that could mean right so right. It's something that we can't take. We can't take our foot off the pedal on this at all. Yeah. Well, before we go, please tell people, how can they get connected to Go So if they got a young man and they are saying, listen, this sounds like the program for me, how do they get connected? So I would say, you know, you can always walk in our doors. Our doors are always open. Um, we're at 75 116th Street in East Harlem. Our website is gosonyc.org. You can always reach us there. We do intakes every single day. We do intakes for young men who have never been criminal justice involved, who just want to have access to the resources that we have. We do intakes for young men who have been criminal justice involved. And we also will work with young men who are incarcerated if they're within our age, within our age group. So we, we are, you know, we're always there. Um, and this is work that we that we want to do and we feel proud of. 
I want to thank the president and CEO of Go. So thank you so much for being with us and uh, continue the great work that's going on as a native of Harlem. Uh, I'm proud to have uh, another organization that's out there making a difference. Thank you so much. Thank you, Darren. All righty, Dr. Jocelyn Rainey, our guest here on Open. Listen, we got more show coming up, so we encourage you to stay with us. We are coming right back right after this. When taking public transportation, don't touch your phone. Carry hand sanitizer and use it immediately upon leaving the bus or train. Avoid touching your face. If someone is coughing or sneezing, move away. Wash your hands with soap and water as soon as possible. Limit contact with poles. If possible, avoid rush hour. Don't eat or drink on public transportation. Keep your bag off the floor or other surfaces. Avoid directly touching turnstiles. Stay up to date with the latest from your local health department and CDC. And welcome back. Well, Mindful Return is a movement that's actually helping parents navigate through a little choppy terrain of being a working parent. They're committed to helping new parents feel calm, supported, confident, as well as connected. And during COVID-19, many parents were faced with obstacles from working from home, as well as while parenting. And now New York City is entering the phase one of its reopening. What steps can new parents take through their back-to-work transitions? We're pleased to be joined by Lori Mahalik Levine, who is also uh, helping us here from Mindful Return. And she's sharing with us. She's the founder. And Lori, good to have you. It's great to be here, Dan. Thanks so much for having me. Good morning. Thank you. And so, yes, we are excited in, in, in many ways for New York to be in phase one of reopening, right? Uh, but talk to me a little bit about parents and how they're navigating through this whole phase one. Yeah, so I think everybody's just trying to make it through the next day. If you don't <laughs> have childcare, then going back to work is sort of a challenge at the moment. And I'd say that um, it's hard to go back to work after you have a baby, even if we're not in COVID land. And in mm -hmm. COVID land, I think um, there are just infinitely more challenges trying to figure out, you know, how, oftentimes how to work from home or how to find childcare um, if, you know, childcare is so hard to come by these days. Yeah, childcare seems to be a big challenge for uh, a lot of people. And so uh, a lot of people opt to stay actually at home. But give me a little bit about busy professionals, because busy professionals themselves have got to navigate through a whole lot of things. They're trying to do home and, and navigate home, but at the same time, got business to tend to. You got Zoom meetings, right? So give us a little bit about that. Yeah, so I think probably the best thing that a new parent can do is to really set some boundaries at home between work and child. And to the extent there's um, there are two adults in the house, you know, really staggering schedules. So for example, one person takes the morning to work and the other person's with the baby and then switching and being really concrete and clear about when you're doing what, because the, the biggest uh, factor in creating guilt in a parent is feeling like you're supposed to be in two places at the exact same time. Yeah. But when you talk about that, it's, it's juggling. And I think that many, many parents are still saying, Hey, I've got to, I've got to juggle through this hard phase right here. And you know, we all say, look, time management is that big thing that when you talk about juggling, really comes into play. How do you help or how do you counsel those who need some help in the area of time management? Time management, yeah. Okay, so I got two strategies for you. One okay. is something this uh, wonderful author named Daniel Pink calls the MIT, which is the most important thing. And the idea is that you're going to write down and do your most important task first thing in the morning before you do anything else. And um, for me, lately, I've been writing down my MIT on an index card, putting it on my laptop before I go to bed at night so that when I wake up in the morning and whenever I manage to get to my computer after dealing with my kids and all that, um, that's the very first thing that I turn to. Now, the other thing that I want to tell everybody about is the Pomodoro method. I don't know if you've heard of this, but it's a um, time management strategy based after the uh, Pomodoro tomato, the Italian tomato. You might have mm -hmm. seen those, those kitchen timers that have the little twist and you, you know it like ticks down the time. So you don't need the, the tomato timer, but you do need a timer. And the concept is that you set the timer for 25 minutes and you turn off everything in your life that dings or buzzes at you. And you do the one project that you need to focus on. Maybe it's your MIT, maybe it's something else for that 25 minute period. Then you get a five to 10 minute break to go around, do whatever else you want. And then you come back and do another Pomodoro. 
And honestly, on the days when I've actually gotten something done during COVID, it's been when I've used this particular strategy to tune everything else out and just do that one thing for the 25 minutes. You know, I think it's hard, though. I mean, when you when you look at it, right, trying to actually navigate to a place where you can shut some stuff off, notifications, alarms. I yeah. mean, we, 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 we all have it. What do you say to that parent, that, that parent or that person who says, Look, I just can't do it? For 25 minutes, you can do anything. It's my dare. <laughs> um, you know, <laughs> noise canceling headphones are great. Um, you know, it is possible to turn off the announcements that you can shut down your email, walk to a different part of the room open up a piece of paper instead of your computer, for example, put your phone to the side. And every time you feel that pull, like I need to get out of my chair, I need to be doing something else, write down the thing that you thought you had to do and go back to that later. So it's, it's there waiting for you. You just need to like carve out some uninterrupted time. Yeah. You know, many people are coming back to work after a pandemic. You got parents who are coming back to work after a pandemic and say, listen, I've spent considerable time with my family. I love my family. I've enjoyed them. But now comes this detachment and you're detaching from your family to go back to work. And, you know, I remember being a parent and having my son and, you know, and that detachment, putting him into daycare. Well, I think there are going to be some parents who have this detachment about leaving their family and work. So what do you say to family members or parents that are really trying to wrestle with that detaching and now going back to work? Yeah, so a couple of things. One is to the extent there is some sort of phase in that's possible, so you don't have to go whole hog on the first day, I totally recommend that. So, you know, even whenever you're transitioning a child to childcare or daycare, they often don't want you to send them for the whole day the first day. So to the extent there's a transition, that's helpful. Um, it's always helpful, I think, to make the, the transition from one care provider to another go pretty quickly. So it's not that you're lingering around and, you know, letting a lot of emotion and anxiety happen, but you know, you're saying, okay, we're making a transition and then you make it and you move on. Um, third thing is establish a transition ritual. So ever since my kids have been in daycare and now they're seven and nine, uh, we have this thing called hug, kiss, tush, mm -hmm. where the kids are allowed to give us one hug, one kiss and one push out the door, which gives them a little bit of like physical power, but they're not normally allowed to push us, right? But right. in this moment, it gives them a little bit of security. Like, okay, well, if I can push them out the door, then I can take a step back and I'm physically separated and we're no longer holding on to, you know, they're no longer on my leg. And then the fourth thing is, I think we just need to be patient and like offer a lot of extra cuddle time and, you know, a lot of extra connection during the times when we are together at home. Yeah, mental health is big. I think it's a really big component for this season. Um, and there are a lot of people who are really struggling. What do you, what advice do you have for parents who are struggling in that mental health component? What do you, what do you offer and what do you say? Yeah. So a couple of things. One, remember that, you know, telehealth is available, that there are lots of therapists who are willing to see you online. There's no shame in talking to someone about your mental health is I think the first thing I'd say. The second thing I'd say is that, um, little tiny pieces of your day can make a huge difference in terms of changing your mindset. So, um, the neuroscience shows that in only 17 seconds, we can change uh, from a negative mindset to a positive mindset if we're focusing on the good. And so I'd say to adopt little practices throughout the day, it can really make a difference. For example, a gratitude journal before you go to bed at night can help stop you from ruminating and um, just worrying about all the, the, the things that are happening in life and help you to focus on a couple of really good things that happen during the day. I think transition periods are really important to focus on. So like in that time right before you sit down to do work, um, when you've just been with your kids to like take a really deep calming breath and, you know, just sort of refocus on, on the work instead of the home, you know, taking those pauses can help. I use a, an app called Insight Timer, which I totally love uh, just to sit down. You can turn the timer on for as little as one minute and just sit and breathe and just really remember to give yourself that space. What are the most common mistakes people are making during this time? I think um, trying to do home and work at exactly the same time is a big one. Um, you know, like being on your phone, trying to respond to an email while your kids are trying to demand peanut butter and jelly from you. Um, it, to the extent it's possible for even the five minutes that you're making the peanut butter and jelly to put the phone down, I think is, is a lot more guilt reducing. Um, and I think parents not giving themselves any time alone whatsoever is another mistake. Um, you know, on the weekend right now, my husband and I swap out, swap off and I have 
three hours on Saturday and he has three hours on Sunday where it's just me and I go wander the neighborhoods. <laughs> I just go like listen to some podcasts. And I, I know it's a challenge to get childcare and maybe to have some backup. Um, but, you know, to the extent you can have carve out a little bit of time for yourself, like it's not a guilty pleasure. It's sort of necessary to our mental health right now. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that's, you know, carving out that time is so, so, so important. Uh, before we go, final thoughts about what you want to let people know about uh, Mindful Return. Great. Um, well, we're here to support all parents returning to work after parental leave. Uh, I wrote a book called Back to Work After Baby that you can find on Amazon. And you can check us out at www.mindfulreturn.com or on all the normal social media channels at Mindful Return. All right. Well, thank you so much, Lori. And listen, we want you to stay with us because we got more open coming up. We'll be right back in a few. It looks bleak. It feels bleak. But the city isn't shut down because our public services keep working. In spite of, and in the face of, the dangers, we can count on them. And to keep them working and funded now and in the future, we need to be counted. Self-respond now to the 2020 census at my2020census.gov. And we are back. Well, during the pandemic, lockdown orders were implemented. And as they were implemented, lockdown does not mean that you should put your health on hold. It's just as important for you to see your local doctor and uh, you can visit them for non-coronavirus conditions. Our next guest is working towards adapting the resources uh, he's providing in order to meet the needs of his patients during uh, this post-COVID crisis and, gosh, I should say COVID and post-COVID crisis. And here to tell us a little bit more about that is orthopedic surgeon, uh, Dr. Arnold Wilson. And Dr. Wilson, good to have you. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Listen, I want to talk to you a little bit about uh, uh, health is a major concern. Um, but for you, I know you had to make some adjustments because uh, even though COVID was was running rampant, it almost for a second, it, it, did it stop what you had to do as far as being that orthopedic surgeon? It, it nearly stopped us. We had to very, very quickly accommodate and adjust to telemedicine. Now, telemedicine is something that I think doctors know about or knew about, but most doctors weren't implementing in their practice, especially doctors who are surgeons. Doctors who are surgeons are used to really interacting with patients in a live setting and doing surgery. So for a surgeon to do telemedicine, it was something that we had to learn very quickly and had to adjust to. And uh, I had a very good technical team who was able to implement a telemedicine platform, which allowed me to interact with my patients virtually. And that was very, very beneficial during the pandemic because it gave the confidence to my patients that I was still around and could still provide services and could give them updates as to if they needed surgery, when that surgery could be performed. It also allowed me to see new patients, new patients who, like you mentioned, who have conditions that were not COVID-19 related, but needed to be addressed. People who broke their arm or hurt their knee or hurt their shoulder, these are problems which can be very painful and need to be addressed even in the time of a pandemic. Yeah, so, so how, do, how do you navigate that? I mean, when you talk about the potential for a broken arm or broken leg and you got the order to stay at home, how, did, how do you make that adjustment? Well, we are, we are essential providers. So if somebody calls me and they had, and a, as a matter of fact, I did have a young woman who was jumping on a trampoline at home and broke her ankle. So even though we were in, the time of the pandemic, her ankle needed to be fixed and it, her surgery was considered urgent or emergent. So despite the fact that we were in a pandemic, I during the pandemic, my office was open on a very little limited basis, one or two days a week. 
I was able to see her in the office, evaluate her fracture, look at her x-rays, and we did her surgery as an emergency during the pandemic. Yeah. So also for those who are, you know, trying to navigate, you know, post COVID, obviously for those, there are going to be some, they're going to say, listen, I'll come out and I'll come to the office. I know that you still have that available as well, but then also you have the, you know, the, the televisits. Um, and so how effective have they been and how much are people cooperating with televisits? Is there a lot of resistance to it? Um, I think, I, I think initially both the, the doctor and the patient were very, we're, we're both resisting, but I think we've all adjusted. Uh, it does take adjustment and it's very technical dependent. So I have to have good Wi-Fi. The patient has to have good Wi-Fi and we all have to be, it has to be timed appropriately that I'm on the call at the right time and the patient's on the call at the right time. If all those boxes are checked off and everything works out, uh, it can be very, very beneficial, and it can allow me to interact with patients. You know, unfortunately, there's many patients in our society that are still maybe afraid to come to the doctor. They've heard in the media maybe older people shouldn't be venturing out of their homes. Telemedicine is a, is a good way for a doctor like me to interact with those people. Sometimes older people who are people who are not technologically savvy need a coach, maybe a younger person to help them navigate their, the technology. Hopefully they have a technology. Hopefully they have a smartphone or a good computer and a younger person can act like a coach and coach that patient into how to use the technology or maybe even set it up. And that's important. You know, to have a younger person who can hopefully help you set that up. I know I lean into my son all the time as well uh, for some some additional help. And I think I'm pretty I think I'm pretty good. But definitely uh, getting some help in this season would definitely be good. Um, so how about the virus and health? I mean, uh, aching joints, muscles. Um, these are things that are also, you know, a lot of people are contending with. Yeah. Yeah. I think the emphasis has to be that. Even in this time where, where, where maybe we're all a little bit frightened by the virus, by the pandemic, it's important to know that you can address um, normal or emergent aches and pains, and they can be addressed. It, um, you can see a doctor like myself, uh, our offices are open. And you can come in and interact with the doctor in a safe environment. Uh, and somebody chooses to, to seek care in my office, I wear a mask and the patient wears a mask and everything is done in a very appropriate socially distancing environment. Uh, we've adjusted the waiting room so there's not too many people in the waiting room. All our rooms are thoroughly cleaned before and after uh, somebody goes into an examination room. So we've adjusted so that people who choose to go back and see a doctor in person, it's a very safe environment and it's very possible. Well, we want to tell people definitely to take advantage of uh, televisits and definitely uh, in this season, it's going to be the way that we're going post COVID-19. Uh, give me the final thing about I understand you see about 10 patients a week, but but how many, uh, and that's in person. Uh, give me a number about how many people you're seeing virtually before we go. Um, actually, uh, we have, we're seeing more and more patients in the office, but in the height of the pandemic, uh, I was seeing probably 75 to 100 people per week via telemedicine. Now we're, we're shifting back to seeing patients in person. Now we're returning to seeing 15 to 20 patients a day in person. And we're actually mixing up uh, in-person visits with telemedicine so that we can abide by the social distancing criteria we have to follow. Uh, yeah. Well, certainly we'll continue to follow this as we are now reopening and seeing how that transition is going, how many more people will be coming in and uh, how many people will still be staying and doing it virtually. Uh, Dr. Wilson, thank you so much for being with us here on Open. Thank you for having me.
All righty, take care. And listen, we want you to stay with us as well. Listen, we do have more open. We're just going to take a quick break and come right back. we got more show right after this. Who's most at risk for coronavirus? People over 65, people with underlying medical conditions like heart disease, chronic lung disease, asthma, diabetes, people undergoing cancer treatment, and people with weakened immune systems. What should you do if you or a loved one is at higher risk? Avoid close contact with people. Avoid crowds. Stay home if you can. Wash your hands frequently. Learn more ways to protect yourself and others at coronavirus.gov. And we welcome you back here to Open and Darren Jaime here with you. I want to let you know about the Bronx Learning Lounge. It is a collective safe space for innovative educators and also allies of the Bronx and Harlem, as well as Lower Westchester, to actually share some resources and ideas that are enhancing their careers and professional lives, as well as fostering educational opportunities that support underserved communities. And joining us here to tell us a little bit more about the Learning Lounge, we are pleased to join be joined by the CEO of the Bronx Learning Lounge, and we're glad to have Constance Barnes end up. Thank you so much for sharing with us. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure to be here today. Good. So um, I guess the, the initial question is, why don't you introduce uh, people who may not be so familiar with the Learning Lounge as to what the Learning Lounge is all about? Sure. And Darren, I'm going to make sure that you insert the Bronx Learning Lounge because yes. it is specifically the Bronx Learning Lounge. So I am by trade a New York City educator. Um, I started teaching in Hunts Point a few years ago. And a what I, a few, just a few. Um, and I wanted to create a space for teachers like me who may have been thrown into the field, who didn't have a lot of resources, who were searching for other people who had the same ideas as them, wanted to challenge the status quo, needed some resources. And so I came up with this concept for the Bronx Learning Lounge. Um, I am a graduate of the Communitas Accelerator Social Entrepreneur Program, where mm -hmm. we learned how to hone in on our business skills and develop our ideas. So in November of 2019, I decided to launch the Bronx Learning Lounge, which combines an online community with in-person meetings so that teachers in those areas that you mentioned can get together. You know, we have a good brunch catered by Baskin Catering out of the Bronx, and we get together, we share ideas, we do some activities, um, we talk about the problems in our schools, and we collaborate on how to solve those problems. Yeah, and so that's, it's, it's great for educators, right? But talk mm -hmm. to us about this. What, what kind of challenges do you find the educators are having? Sure. So one thing, educators are pretty siloed, right? You're in your school. And right. that's your community. That's your domain. Whereas there may be a school right next door. And if it's not necessarily your elementary school, or your middle school, you don't necessarily know which practices are being shared, which strategies are working and being implemented. So the Bronx Learning Lounge is a place where people can come together. So we're not so siloed. Another major issue for us, especially in the Bronx, and I know for me as a teacher, we don't have resources. Um, there is funding for teachers. And I hope that the process is a little less convoluted than when I was a teacher, but it took a really long time just to get the small portion of the teacher resource fund. I'm probably sure it's probably called something else, but that mm -hmm. money that the city gives you to buy supplies. By that time, you've already spent probably a thousand dollars of your own money to purchase certain things. And so for some charter schools, they may have a little bit more leeway and a little bit more funding to provide things for their teachers. But for most DOE teachers or teachers like in public schools in Yonkers and Mount Vernon, you are spending a lot of your own money to buy resources for your students and for your classroom to be successful. And then of course, um, I'm sorry. No, I said amazing other, because yeah. I, I was just, I'm, I'm also thinking about like, you know, in, in, we're in New York City, this great mm -hmm. metropolis. Why mm -hmm. is it that we've got, you know, the fact that teachers have to go into their pockets to actually continue to fund uh, the mm -hmm. classrooms that they, they provide? I just said mm -hmm. amazing. Mm -hmm. 
Yep. And, you know, there's tons of articles where that's a major factor for a lot of teachers deciding that they're going to leave. They spend so much because you're given basics. Right. And even when you're given a curriculum, you find there are things you need to add to the curriculum to make it a really enriching, not just sage on the stage. I'm reading this book to your students, but a really enriching experience. So a lot of teachers who are creative find themselves spending a lot of money. Um, I read an article maybe last month about a woman. And she said like in the first semester, she spent a thousand dollars. She was a brand new school teacher. She had no idea this was something she was going to have to do. And so one of the things we also want to do with the Bronx Learning Lounge is recycle or upcycle resources. So Darren, let's say you were teaching eighth grade last year and you have resources on the constitution and I'm now moving into eighth grade. If you're no longer mm -hmm. using those, the Bronx Learning Lounge will be that conduit to say, Constance, there's some resources over here. Here's the medium for exchange. Go get those resources for Darren. So we've been asking um, teachers, educators, ex-principals, if you have things, give us the things and we'll recycle the things for you. Mm -hmm. And so having those resources available, um, for a teacher itself, how valuable is that? Because sharing resources uh, seems to also be this big problem, right? Mm -hmm. that, to have mm -hmm. access to resources. I mm -hmm. think on one side, you got kids who got, are struggling to have supplies. And then right. on the other side, you got educators who are really struggling to have resources. Exactly. So I remember when I started teaching, and I can clearly remember the teacher's name, Miss McConnell, Donna McConnell, if she's in the Bronx listening, thank you for all you did. But she was my next door teacher. And I was a brand new teacher at MS 201 in the Bronx. I just walked into the classroom. I had no supplies. And Donna came over and she said, here's some markers, here's some chalk, here's some white paper, here's this, here's that. And she gave me all of these things because I literally was standing there like, so what am I supposed to do with these kids for right. the next seven hours in the day? So it's really important to have that someone who one is willing to come and share supplies with you, but has the supplies to share. So um, again, that's one of the things that we try to foster because as a new teacher, it is very intimidating to just be in a new school. You may not know anybody. Um, so we provide that support system, just a network of teachers, former principals that you can connect with and talk to and say, I don't know what I'm doing in this room. Can somebody help me? So for people who want to get connected to you before we wrap mm -hmm. up, tell us how, how they can get connected to you. Sure. You can find us on Facebook at the Bronx Learning Lounge. You can find us on Instagram at the Bronx Learning Lounge. And through either one of those mediums, you can easily connect to my website and find out about our next event. Well, Constance, we want to thank you so much for being with us, sharing a little bit about the Bronx Learning Lounge. Glad to have you and glad to have that resource available for uh, educators. You know, sometimes we think educators have it all and know it all, but mm -hmm. to know that educators need some resources and you're providing that, thank you so much for what you do. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. All righty. Constance Barnes, our guest here, founder and CEO of the Bronx Learning Lounge. Listen, we do have more open coming up, so we want you to stay with us. We're going to come right back right after this. Why should young people care about the spread of coronavirus? Well, we know that people with underlying medical conditions over the age of 60 are at highest risk, but they've got to get it from somebody. So we're asking everyone to be selfless for others so that we can protect those who are most susceptible. Not going to bars, not going to restaurants. It all just means physical separation so that you have a space between you and others for more information on how you can social distance, please go to coronavirus.gov. Hey, yeah, welcome back here to Open. Darren Jaime here with you. The Partnership for the Homeless is a not-for-profit organization that is focusing on committed to building a just and equitable society, as well as creating lasting community change through solution-oriented programs and policy initiatives, eliminating the root causes of homelessness. In these uncertain times, the question is, how has the pandemic affected the homeless community here in New York City? 
Our guest in studio is the CEO of Partnership for the Homeless, uh, uh, Anya Dugan, and we're pleased to have her sharing with us. Good to be talking to you. Thank you so much for doing this. I know this uh, interview takes place at a good time. I know, uh, first and foremost, I guess there's some good news out there for uh, New Yorkers who may be suffering with possible rent evictions and things of that nature. And uh, I know you just got a new funding stream. We have just gotten a new funding stream, a private funding stream to help families who are facing eviction, um, you know, primarily to help people who have rent arrears due to COVID. And so we do encourage people to go to our website, which is um, partnershipforthehomeless.org, to see how they can apply for that funding, because we want to make sure that we get it to as many families as possible. Uh, we, we talk about people with everyday jobs, but that homeless population, we knew that it was a problem before COVID-19 and certainly a problem now. Well, there's sort of two ways that people are being um, directly impacted. The first is people who are already experiencing homelessness, so people who are on the street or people who are living in shelters. And then the second group of people who are impacted are, um, you know, the hundreds of thousands of people who have lost their jobs and who sort of are barely making ends meet and who cannot afford rent and other basic necessities. And so for the first group of people, the, the concern is, people living in congregate shelters, so that's mostly people on the single adult side of the shelter system, and also people who are uh, forced to live on the streets or take sort of refuge in the subway system who are, you know, more at risk. They tend to have more underlying conditions, and so our big concern there is the health risk for all of those individuals and making sure that they're safe. And then the work of the partnership right. is primarily on prevention, and so um, we have seen more and more families fall into arrears over the last few months than we have ever experienced in our entire 38 year history. Well, give me a little bit about this because we know that there was a moratorium that was placed on eviction. And so that did help some people, right? Uh, but on the other side of it, you had people who were on that slippery slope already, I presume. So give us a little bit about how, how things are playing out in that area. So the moratorium is an enormous help, but it's only a first step. The moratorium on its own doesn't save anybody from eviction <clears throat> in the long run. Right. So because the moratorium is due to end in mid-August and by the time it ends, many families will have up to five months of arrears. And most of the families who have lost their jobs are um, those were low paying jobs. And so even if they get lucky and get, you know, get reemployed come the end of the, the sort of lockdown, there is no way that they will be able to afford four or five months of arrears. And so the big concern for them is that they may be facing eviction as soon as the moratorium lifts. And yeah. one of the pieces of work is to make sure that we have private funding to help pay off arrears. Um, but I think the big concern among everybody in the housing and homelessness community is the lack of um, government stepping up at any level to provide rental assistance for families. And it says about, about 65,000 of our fellow st city uh, residents don't have stable housing. Uh, and it's indeed for the estimated 3,500 city residents that are living on streets more than 60,000, including 22,000 in children and uh, children in shelters across the five boroughs. Um, those are some pretty staggering numbers. They are staggering numbers, right? We already have a, a mass homelessness crisis in the city even before COVID. And those, what those numbers really tell you is who's impacted. So, you know, it is mostly families and it's mostly families with young children. So the largest population in the shelter system is you know, children under the age of 18, and most of them would be um, young toddlers and sort of in the single digits. And what we need ultimately to help solve the housing crisis is investments by all level of government in affordable housing and in permanent supportive housing. And in the meantime, you know, due to COVID, what we need to see is government stepping in to ensure those numbers don't get worse. So if we already have over 60,000 people in shelters and on the streets, we need to make sure that we have money for eviction prevention so that we don't have hundreds of thousands of more families joining them. Yeah. Uh, what are you hearing on the street? I mean, obviously, there's a lot of great concern. Uh, we're in the first phase of reopening up uh, here in the city, but a lot of people still have a lot of concerns. Right. It is, you know, primarily we are hearing from families who already have arrears and who don't know what they're going to do. Um, and who are concerned that they won't become re-employed for several months. Just because the city has begun to open up doesn't mean that people are going to get their jobs back in areas like restaurants or cleaning jobs 
um, and in retail, which is, you know, most of the jobs that have been lost, right? So that's one concern. Another concern that we're hearing is from undocumented families who are being um, harassed by landlords. And so the eviction moratorium is something that those landlords are not paying particular attention to and putting pressure on those families uh, to continue to pay rent. And of course, for families who are undocumented who have lost their jobs, they don't have the extra resource of unemployment benefits very often. And even if they're eligible um, because of a minor in the household, they're usually too afraid to, to access that benefit. So we are really concerned about the well-being of undocumented families in the city. Yeah, they, they are really um, a, a huge number. And uh, are, are you worried uh, have this history already that uh, that number is going to continue to balloon? Well, what we see with undocumented families and the story that we have heard over and over again is that anyone that we've spoken to recently has been saying that they have worked the entire time that they've been in New York City. This is the first time they've ever needed any kind of assistance. And so yeah. that's particularly difficult for the families. The, you know, these are individuals who work really hard jobs. Uh, but because of COVID, through no fault of their own, they've not been able to do that. And so they don't, they don't have a robust sort of support system in order to be able to afford basic necessities like rent and food. And so unless rental assistance kicks in, um, and it, it has to go beyond the private funding, unless it kicks in at the federal level. I mean, the federal level is really the cornerstone of the answer to this problem. And there is, you know, there is a move in Congress to include $100 billion in emergency rental assistance in the next um, disaster relief package. And really, we need to see that passed in order to help not just families in New York, but all around the country who are facing the same thing. Yeah. So we began talking about the new funding that's available. Um, and I'm sure there may be some Bronxites who are saying and across the city who are saying, listen, how do I tap into this? How do I get connected to this? Uh, what was your response be? So the easiest way is to go to our website, which is partnershipforthehomeless.org. They can also call the partnership. It's uh, 212-645-34444. Um, and they can speak to anybody at the partnership who can put them in touch with uh, you know, the staff who will assist them get access to this funding. But essentially, it's anybody who's in arrears who needs help um, can apply for that funding. And so there's, there's no eligibility requirements? The, we have eligibility requirements for government funding, but because this is private funding, we're able to extend the eligibility. Um, you know, the vast majority of people are going to be low income. Um, the vast majority of people who've lost their jobs. Just to give an idea of what we're talking about here, more than two thirds of the jobs lost due to COVID are jobs that pay $40,000 or less. So we're talking mm -hmm. about families and individuals who are very low income, um, who, you know, who don't have savings and who, who are not able to sort of take care of the basic necessities. And that's the group of people that, that we are targeting. Um, and, you know, we expect to be overwhelmed with the need. Um, so in addition, to, in addition to this private funding and, and this, uh, this available help at this moment, we, we, we do want to see some federal funding kick in for those families as well. Mm. Well, Anya, thank you so much for you know, taking the time and sharing with us. Uh, once again, want to get people connected, so please tell them before we wrap up, how are they able to get connected to you? So they can go to our website at partnershipforthehomeless.org or they can call the, the partnership directly at 212-645-3444. All righty. We got to leave it there. But thank you so much for sharing with us and uh, continue the great work. Obviously, we know uh, a lot of New Yorkers are being affected by this housing, uh, this housing crunch. And of course, COVID-19 really playing and wreaking havoc uh, on a lot of people. Thank you for the great work that you're doing. And thank you for getting the word out to Bronx residents. That's really helpful. Oh, no problem. Thank you. Anya Dugan, our guest here uh, on Open, that uh, she's with the Partnership for the Homeless. Unfortunately, uh, we're out of time. That's the end of our show today. I want to thank all of our guests for joining us. And also want to thank you, the viewer, for tuning in. Now, if you missed any part of our show, you can catch the Recable Cast on Bronx's Channel 67, Verizon Files, that be Channel 33, or anytime on the web at bronxnet.org. For all of us here on the set of Open, I am Darren Jaime saying take care, God bless, and most of all, keep this channel wide open. Take care.